Happy Sunday. We're going to have Holy Communion after this because, uh, sorry for the uh, wrong printing of the sequence, because this is so that our folks who are watching this on cyberspace will not have to wait for us. Uh, because in our church, we have decided that we will not do cyberspace Holy Communion. So we also don't want a situation that when you are having Holy Communion here, somebody is observing it in their own house. Because we... we there is a big uh, debate about this. And I must say also that pastors are quite divided about this. Uh, after preaching to you guys in the afternoon, I will be preaching to another church in Mandarin, a, a brethren church, and they will have cyberspace uh, Holy Communion. They have it every single worship service. So it's, it's, I must say it's a little bit odd uh, because uh, you know, you, you, you're you looking at the presiding minister or for their case, the elder who will be leading the Holy Communion then is in cyberspace then apparently they instruct their people to prepare their own bread and all that at home all that so it's a little bit odd I would say uh, but I think if circumstances are, are very pressing then it, I, I am open enough for it but like I said we already had our discussion at the Synod level and the decision for all uh, Reformed Evangelical Churches would be that we will not have cyberspace kind of uh, Holy Communion and in the sense, for the moment at least, if this whole pandemic carry on even further, uh, I, I don't quite know what Sinod will decide, especially in Indonesia. It's a, quite a difficult place right now. For us, we can still gather here. And so we, we are able to do a uh, weekly Holy Communion as we will do, be doing today. So, okay, uh, let's carry on with the preaching and the teaching for the Gospel of Luke. And we are entering into pretty difficult territory where our Lord Jesus Christ is facing a lot of impending difficulties. I, and I want to be able to relate that to your own life as well. So in the preaching, I will want to reflect upon what it means to know that our Lord Jesus Christ has gone through all this and what does it mean for us. Let's do a quick review as to the last uh Lesson. In the last lesson, we were focusing only on the denial of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Apostle Peter, a most important event in the church. And again, depending on which denomination you come from, the Apostle Peter has a very special position, especially within the Roman Catholic Church. For he is considered the first Pope of the Roman Catholics. And that's a very big deal. And of course, the Roman Catholics are different from us. They have a lot of saints. Uh, so you can pray to the saints, to ask the saints to intercede for you. Now this we completely disagree. So among all these saints, Peter is the first of the, all the saints or the first most important of the saints. So they even have the St. Peter Basilica, which is a huge, huge church building, largest in the entire world, where the Apostle Peter supposedly uh, was buried underneath there. And so they treat Peter as a, a very revered kind of a character. For us, we understand Peter as the key lead of all the apostles. At the same time, we do not believe that he is above anybody else or is elevated into some kind of a divine, semi-divine kind of a stage. But still, there are many lessons to learn from it. First thing we notice is that our Lord Jesus Christ knew that he's going to deny him and not only deny him, but deny him three times. And all the Gospels recorded this particular incident to signify how important this particular thing is. And at the same time, Jesus Christ revealed that it was Satan who sought permission to sift him like wheat, so to, to, to throw him up and down like wheat. And the word uh, him or you is plural in the original Greek, which meant that it's not just him, but all the leaders. So I spent some time talking about how Satan particularly would want to target key leaders in the church because Jeremiah said you strike the shepherd and the sheep will disperse. And so Christian leadership calls upon your, in a sense, upon yourself more trials and more difficulties. And I want to be very clear about this. As I was mentioning last week, I don't mean the pastors or just the deacons or people with official title, but anyone, and there are many among us, who would want to do the work of God wherever you are. And I, I'm thankful and privileged to serve alongside many of my co-workers here in this congregation who take lead in many, many ministry areas. And I want to keep encouraging you to understand this. I hope that 
if you don't learn anything from my ministry, at least you learn the idea that you are responsible to the Lord yourself and you read the word of God to understand where God is leading you to. And I really have no doubt whatsoever that if I put a gun on your head, uh, most of you can start a church. You know, it's, it's not a problem. It's just that you, you, you are constrained by a lot of the thinking processes of the present world. But when you serve God, then know that Satan will be at work and there will be issues relating to ministry. And even as you walk the journey of faith, you will know that that is the case as well. And Jesus said, however, I will pray for you. And here comes the intercession role of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that even now as I speak, our Lord is on the right side, hand side of God and interceding for us. Now, this is a very mysterious and profound kind of uh, idea, but that's what is affirmed by the Bible. And so there are many things that we can learn from them. We are reminded once again that there is an absolute necessity of trials and temptation. Senior Pastor Dr. Stephen Tong always emphasized this and I am very influenced by this particular understanding uh, of the Bible that he has uh, emphasized over and over again that indeed it is true that trials and temptations are things that are absolutely necessary for us to grow in faith. And Peter then, of course, talked big, right? He said, no, you know, it never happened. Everybody will desert you. Everybody will run away except me. I'm going to go to prison for you. I'm going to die for you. And But the reality was that, of course, he then de denied our Lord. And the interesting aspect of the denier was that the Bible tells us that the Lord passed by and looked at him. Um, and this was only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. No, nowhere else is this recorded. So the guess is that Jesus was being tried and Jesus was being tortured, was being beaten up and was led through the courtyard where Peter was at and somehow they saw each other. And the look of the Bible did not tell us what is it that Jesus said to Peter or, or look at Peter, but we can already sort of guess that it probably is a, a look of I told you so or, or disappointment or, or it, it cannot be a happy look. <laughs> So because of that, the Bible says that Peter then went out and wept bitterly. All of a sudden, he remember that that's exactly what the Lord has said uh, to him. And that's a very important lesson as well. That our Lord knew that he's going to deny him and that act itself grieved Jesus Christ tremendously. But the very good news, of course, is there was full recovery. And we see that in John 21 where Jesus would ask Peter, after the resurrection of Jesus, on the third time he appeared to the people, he spoke directly to Peter and asked him, do you love me? Three times. The three, do you love me? In exchange for the three deniers of Peter. And for me, I certainly am reassured that there is a blessed assurance for us all that no matter who we are, if we belong to our Lord, you may grieve our Lord over and over and over and over again, the way Peter did, but he would recover us. And this is called perseverance of the saints, that if you truly belong to God, he will see it through that at the end of the day, you will still be recovered by him. However, that doesn't give you a license to do whatever you want to do in life, because at the end of the day, if you truly love our Lord Jesus Christ, you, you will not want to be like Peter, who then earned that kind of look from, from Jesus, grieving him over and over again. It is ultimately about a relationship that we should have with our Lord Jesus Christ following him. I want to emphasize this again and again. I, was, I just downloaded a new book. You know, I keep quoting John Piper, this interesting pastor from the United States. Uh, his son, Barnabas Piper, apparently wrote a book called the PK. Uh, PK stands for Pastor's Kid. But PK also stands for problem kid. <laughs> so, but apparently two of, two of Piper's children became really quite uh, crazy. One, uh, one, Abraham Piper was really excommunicated from the church, you know, can you believe it? But Barnabas Piper was the one who is a little bit more, more quiet uh, in Hokkien, you know. He, he didn't give any problem. But then he wrote a book to, to say that actually it doesn't look like it. Uh, Although on the surface, I may look okay, I follow my father all the years of his life as he was in ministry. But in reality, there's a lot of issues and a lot of difficulty. Finally, he said that actually the final conclusion he found 
of this is, at the end of the day, it's about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ more than the church system or whatever system my father is in or whether I'm a pastor's kid or not. And that's a very good reminder for us all, including the two PKs that live in my house. It's about the personal relationship that all of you must have with our Lord Jesus Christ, not about the systems or whatever. And I, so I pray that in the preaching sessions, you will get to understand this. So after the denial of Peter, Jesus went on to continue to teach and prepare his apostles for the days to come. And that's the focus that we will have for today. Let's come to the Lord in a word of prayer and commit the time into his hand. Let us pray. We thank you, God Almighty, for any opportunity we can have to come close to you. For we know that there are many people in the world who do not know you, or they may know you but find it tremendously difficult because of one circumstances or another to come close to you or to worship you. And yet here we are. We do pray that you grant us an appreciation of this deep in our heart so that we will humbly come before you and be teachable and be open to your word coming into our heart. May we prepare our heart like good soil so that your word will enter into our heart and enlighten us, that we may recognize that it is your truth that is speaking and then turn our life around. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For your God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so remember that our Lord is going to face tremendous difficulty and tremendous physical, emotional, and even spiritual pain and suffering as he moved forward. So he had foreknowledge about that. And so he was preparing his disciples. So he was preparing Peter, telling him that you're going to deny me three times. And then he turned to his other apostles in the next few verses. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money back or knapsack or sanders, did you lack anything? They said nothing. Now, actually, we have preached through this portion before. Jesus Christ reminded the apostle, hey, you remember last time when I sent you out, I told you to take nothing. And this is in reference to the much earlier verses found in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, the Bible says that the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was to go. So they were preparing the way for Jesus Christ to go and preach the gospel. At that time, Jesus is very popular because of the signs and wonders that he did. So it's, it's a little bit like our senior pastor, you know. Um, of course, I had the privilege of working with him since 1997. And I know that a lot of you are very used to him. So it's like, no big deal kind of thing. But in many towns and many villages around the world, as I travel with him, some of them really look forward to him coming because he, he's like a whirlwind, hurricane kind of a presence, you know. And everywhere we go, especially if you haven't been to that place for a long time, the, the people are like freaking out. You know? like he's, he's like a superstar appearing and they will, they, will, they will wait for him. They will have Bible for him to sign, babies for him to bless and, and all that. So much so that every time we go, we have to prepare an escape route for him. <laughs> After the preaching, we must find a way to let him escape quickly because if not, he will be surrounded by a lot of people who just refuse to let him go. Sometimes we, we are a little bit slow and the people will swarm the stage. <laughs> Uh, especially a lot of folks from mainland China. He, he's like big deal and they want to take picture with him one after another. So Christ at that, at Duke 10 was like that. Very popular and the people were sent out to, to prepare the place. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers to, into his harvest. Go your way. Now behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. And verse 4 says, Carry no knapsack, no sanders, and greet no one in the road. Greet no one in the road means that you don't go and negotiate things from people and get favor from people. You go in faith because at that time, because of the popularity of Christ, you will be well taken care of. All you have to do is say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and people will house you, they will feed you, they will give you everything. Some people interpret this verse as a blanket kind of a command that you go out there, you take nothing and you live by faith and, and have nothing. That's not true because the context was that Jesus was very popular. However, by the time we reached Duke 22, 
Jesus knew that he's going to be arrested soon. He then said to them in verse 36, but now, but now, now it's different ballgame. Let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack. Now the time has changed. So if you have a money bag, you better go prepare money and you have a, a knapsack to keep your things, you better take it. And the verse that is difficult is the next verse. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. You sell your cloak and go and buy a sword. But let me deal with the one that is earlier. So clearly we see that the situation has drastically changed. Earlier it was a, a case whereby Jesus was welcome everywhere, but now it was not so. And the disciples were taught by our Lord that you better now go prepare for money because the days ahead is going to be very difficult. You better go prepare yourself with knapsack and even with a sword. Because the disciples are going to face a lot of danger and persecutions ahead and so must prepare themselves. And historically, we know that that's the case, right? Every single one of the original 12, not counting Judas, died terrible death. Except maybe the Apostle John, because he was in the island of Patmos and exiled there. Also quite terrible because he was alone all by himself. But the rest is really horrifying, right? I have actually preached on this before. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was arrowed to death. Not the SAF kind of arrow. Uh, it's real arrow. He shoot shot to death. Uh, all kinds. Thomas was probably speared to death. The worst of them all, Bartholomew, I will always remember this. He was frayed to death. F-R-A-Y. That means you, in Chinese, it's called Ling Xing Chu Si. That means you take a piece of knife, you cut his flesh bit by bit and bit, 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 bit. <laughs> if you think about it, it's in the skin crawl, right? That's why the symbol for Bartholomew is a flaring knife. So it, 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 the church history tells us that they all really face very, very serious difficulty. And our, but the interesting thing here is that our Lord was telling them that, hey, you know, you've got to change strategy. You've got to prepare for it. Herein lies an important lesson for us all. Now, recently in the world, the word dogmatic is becoming a dirty word. To be dogmatic means that you follow a certain dogma as absolute truth. And so I don't know whether you realize this or not, but the whole world, uh, especially in the media, has been saying that anybody who's dogmatic is backward, is stupid, is not open to changes. And of course, a lot of it refers to people like us. Because to be dogmatic means that you believe something to be absolutely true. And we believe in the absolute truth. So therefore, without a doubt, we are dogmatic people. For example, you believe in the existence of God. And that's a dogma, you know. It is not negotiable. If it's negotiable, you don't have to be here. Okay, go home and sleep. It's not. So then a lot of things in our faith, especially in a Reformed evangelical understanding, we are indeed dogmatic. However, it is important for you to know what you are dogmatic about. Now, the irony is that those people who, who argue against absolute truth absolutely believe that there is no absolute truth. So that in itself is a dogma. So don't be frightened by all these words about being dogmatic. The question is, what are you dogmatic about? Would you then look at Luke chapter 10 and say, hey, you know, Jesus Christ said, don't carry anything. Don't, don't have knapsack, don't have everything. So I'm going to treat this as absolute truth and go into the field or go to China, go to Papua, and I won't take a single cent from anyone and go there and I expect God to work miracle and feed me. I don't know, maybe the birds will carry some leftover hamburger or something. Then I can survive. Because you see, what that's what Jesus said. But that was not how Jesus Christ looked at it. But it takes a lot of wisdom to know what you should be dogmatic about and what you should not be. Our problem is that we are always dogmatic about the wrong thing. For example, the style of worship. Some of the things are not very important. People get very upset and very excited about it. And then they, 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 they go out there and then they, they yell at people for doing something that is very different. And so one of the statements that is always made is this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now, a lot of people are supposedly the one who originated this particular quote. From Augustine to Malachon, and a lot of different claims. So I never put in a statement of who come up with this. But I personally found this to be an important 
reminder to us all. In essentials, in the essential teachings of the Bible, we, we must have unity. So you cannot come and tell me that, hey, you know, pastor, don't be dogmatic. Lah. Maybe God is not three in one. Maybe God is four in one, five in one, six in one. Possible, you know. Then I say you heretic burn in hell. <laughs> we, we, we cannot. It is an essential understanding. But in the non-essentials, for example, the style of worship, the way you guys are dressed and all that, that's pretty non-essential. But you'll be quite surprised. Huh? In some churches, it's very essential. In some denominations, all the women must wear veil, okay? And cannot dye your hair, okay? So one dye hair, two, two dye hair. Can, cannot dye your hair in some of the, the churches. They, they treat that as very essential. But no, in non-essential things, we should have liberty. In the, For example, the strategy of ministry, as our Lord Jesus Christ has demonstrated, he, he changed the strategy. So those are non-essentials. And no matter what you do in all things, charity. That means you must have an attitude of love even towards those people who are different from you. Ah, but the key problem is, how do you know what is essential, what is not essential? Clearly to some people, being baptized by immersion is essential. So much so that they call themselves the Baptists. So it is a continual difficulty in moving forward. However, if you really have love within your heart for everyone, it should be fine. But as I was saying, the harder verse is the next one. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. This is a deep, one of the noted difficult verse in the Bible because our Lord Jesus Christ clearly said that you should sell your cloak and go and buy a sword. I was just discussing with Patricia the other day. There is a saying in when I was growing up in primary school that durians are, are such a wonderful attraction for people. There's a Chinese saying, Liu Lian Chu, who, what is the next verse? Who knows? Something tall. Liu Lian Chu, Sa Long Tuo. That means if the durian come out, the sarong will. Who knows what happened to the sarong? It's going to be pawn. You, you pawn the sarong so as to buy the durian, to tell you that durians are so attractive that people will do that. When the durian season comes, I got no money, so I pawn my sarong. Even when I was in primary school, I keep asking myself, if the guy pawned the sarong, that doesn't mean the fellow is naked. <laughs> so you sell something to get something that is a lot more needed, a lot more important. So similar here, sell your cloak which is the outer cloak, like, actually, which is typically a, a more precious garment in the time of Jesus Christ, to buy a sword. But the problem is that in Matthew 26, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the soldiers came to arrest him, what happened? Peter drew the sword, cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, whose name, I'll remember this forever and ever, Malchus. How come I remember this? Because Dr. Tong once mentioned this, Malchus, and as a translator, I didn't know the name. <laughs> like, he said Maluku in Chinese. I don't dare to translate Maluku. You know? <laughs> I just said the servant of the high priest. <laughs> and then when I go back and check the Bible, I realized the guy's name is Malchus. Only appeared one time in the Bible and he had to quote it. Now you know how difficult it is to be his translator. So Peter slides off the ear of Malchus and Jesus Christ immediately healed Malchus, which is a, one of the side lessons is that sometimes healing happens without you asking. And this was one of the examples. And what did Jesus say to Peter? You keep your sword. Because those who live by the sword will what? Will die by the sword. And so a lot of Bible scholars look at this verse and say, hey, hello, Jesus said that, how come you, you go, and, you, you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Then I hear it, he couldn't tell them to buy a sword. It doesn't make any sense. Eh? So a lot of Bible scholars then come up with all kinds of stories to say that, oh, he was just talking about figuratively go and buy a sword, an imaginary sword. Be prepared to, 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 to fight a spiritual kind of warfare. A bit like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, right? The, the sword of truth and the kind of imagery. The fact is that our Lord Jesus Christ did ask these people to go buy sword because later they say we have found two swords and he said that's enough. And so the correct interpretation really is in mainstream understanding, again, uh, I'm saying I'm not saying that everybody agree with this, 
especially churches that promote pacifism, non-violence, non-resistance. So they say that Jesus will never ever tell people to buy a sword. For mainstream understanding, we do believe that this demonstrate that our Lord Jesus Christ was allowing self-defense because the apostles and the disciples after our Lord Jesus Christ is crucified, resurrected and ascended, is going to go into a very dangerous world where even when we walk on the street through the wilderness to go from Jerusalem to Jericho, they can be robbed by a lot of people if you have no defense whatsoever. And so you are to carry a sword. So at least the robbers and whatever it is, look at you, you got some weapons, you're going to be de defend yourself. You're not a sitting duck situation and they won't come and attack you. And expanding the thinking further, we do believe that weapons for self-defense is acceptable. And so therefore, in mainstream understanding, we support the establishment of an army or a self-defense force. And so we support national service. And this is very important. There are sects out there that absolutely disagree. The Jehovah Witnesses, for example, which is not mainstream church and considered heretical, does not support any form of military involvement. And therefore, the Jehovah Witness is banned in Singapore, just in case you don't know this, because their children and their boys will not go to national service. They are willing to go to jail. And every single time a Jehovah Witness young man reach 18 years old, they surrender themselves and go tell the government, I am a Jehovah Witness. I will not carry your flag. I will not salute it. I will not carry your weapon. I will not wear your uniform. And then they go to Tangling Detention Barrack for three over years. And then the army will then discharge them, dishonorably discharge. And they are considered incorruptible, incorrigible, and they will never be called out for reservists. So if you want to escape reservists, that's one way also. La. Go to jail for three and a half years. So it's, but for mainstream understanding from verses like this, we think or we believe that it is right for us to defend ourselves. So when Jesus said, those who live by the sword, Jesus meant you take the sword and go attack every Tom, Dick and Harry. You will die by the sword. But we believe in defense. We support the police. We support the army. We support all law and order society. One of the clearest demonstrations of this actually is in the U.S. Army. This guy is a major general, Thomas Solgen, two-star general. And why did I show you his picture? Because he is the chief of chaplains of U.S. Army. So they have a Pastor is for Assembly of God. He's, uh, right now, uh, he is the chief of chaplain of the U.S. Army, two-star general, uh, who hates a lot of chaplains in the U.S. Army. And their chaplaincy in the U.S. Army include Inmans, who are Muslim chaplains, and they also have Hindu chaplains and different kinds of chaplains. But most of them are Roman Catholic and Protestant chaplains. Now, just in case you look at him, this guy got a theological degree and all that. He is a pastor, reverend person. And you think that, you know, this is an army saikong kind of uh, idea. Uh. Not true. Uh. You look at all the badges he wear. These are some of the badges he has. No? Combat action badge. Master parachutist badge. Ranger, okay, hello. Ranger, army staff badge. 75th Ranger Regiment. Silver German parachutist. And then, of course, the chaplain course badge. So these are like pastors who can break your neck in half a second uh, if he wants to. So a kind of a combination of self-defense, but at the same time, a man of God. And so that's the understanding that we do have. So Jesus Christ said, For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressor. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And Jesus quoted from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. And this is how we know that Isaiah 53 is all about our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messianic chapter from Isaiah. And there are many chapters in Isaiah and also the Psalms about the Messiah. Jesus said that the Bible has predicted that this will happen to me, that they will count me as among the criminals and it must be fulfilled. And then they told him that, look here, Lord, there are two swords. And then he said, it is enough. So at that point in time, Jesus Christ knew that he was fulfilling the will of God as he went on to the next stage and moved step by step all the way to the cross. And the next verse says, And then he came down 
up and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. Luke, among all the four Gospels, recorded the Garden of Gethsemane scene in the shortest manner and also has something unique in there that is not found in other uh, Bible. Matthew has a lot of detail in the scene, but Luke here, very simple. He just said that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and didn't even mention the name Gethsemane. As was his custom, means that he always go there to pray. And so in verse 40, when he came to that place, which actually is the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone straw and knelt down and pray. From the other Gospels, we knew that he actually knelt down and prayed and then go back and wake them up again and then go back and pray and then go and wake them up again three times. So the number three is quite interesting for the Bible. It is a repeated kind of set. Jesus did it three times and some people say that it coincides with the idea of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit but they're going a little bit far. But here in Luke, very simple description. A kind of summary almost and he knelt down and he prayed and we all know what he, he prayed. The Gospel of John had a lot of details about what he prayed. But here, they only focus on one key, key thing. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And Luke focused on what he, he impressed him the most. The most important aspect of the, the prayer of Jesus Christ he recorded here that Jesus was struggling with the terrible mission that was placed before him and he then called upon the Lord, if it's possible, can you remove this cup from me? But at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's not my will, but yours be done. And unique to the Gospel of Luke, verse 43, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. These two verses in some of the Bible script, they don't put it in because some of the early script, people who write it, cannot believe that an angel will come and help Jesus Christ because he's supposed to go and struggle by himself and you know face everything by himself. Why should he be strengthened? But by now, all mainstream understanding is that Jesus was indeed strengthened by a angel. And in, historically, this was depicted in many paintings as well. One of the fascinating paintings I come across is this one. This is actually painted by our senior pastor, Dr. Stephen Tong. Don't play, play. Eh? It is a, a replica of Gethsemane by a, a Danish painter called Karl Brock. And he just do a replica on it. So our senior pastor is a very artistic person. This is original. Can you see how closely matched it is? I, I dug this out when I was writing his autobiography. And other than this, there was a, a lot of other painting. And uh, he, he stopped painting for a long time because he has no time to do it. Now he just doodle from time to time on tissue paper and stuff like that. And I swipe a few of it. Lah. So... Next time, it may be worth a lot of money, just in case. You know. <laughs> My retirement fund is re re reliant on all the doodles. So it, <laughs> in this painting, it, it's, the angel came and strengthened our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 45, when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So like I said, in Matthew, he did it three times. And Luke is the only one that says sleeping for sorrow. All the other Gospels just say they were sleeping because Luke was a doctor. So he is very careful with what details. For sorrow means that they are, they are very tired of the whole, whole situation, of very tense and you know very difficult. And Jesus Christ keeps scolding them and saying that, hey, you know, you've got to prepare this and that. So they are all very exhausted. None of them stayed with our Lord through his prayer. And that was, of course, a double whammy kind of insulting for, for Jesus. So then after this, of course, we know that he was then arrested and moved on. And in the next session, we will talk about this. So when I look at the fulfillment of all the things that Jesus Christ have done, we see several things that are coming out very strongly. First of all, we do see the fulfillment of the plan of God for the redemption of the, his people through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So exactly as he said, you know, from Isaiah and Old Testament, all the prediction, and then he step by step is fulfilling all of this. At the same time, we see our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling God's will as a human being without special privileges. As he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you see our Lord Jesus Christ struggling with human limitation. Now in Christology, this is a little bit difficult area that a lot of people have a lot of argument about. We know that as we speak right now, our Lord Jesus Christ is God. When he was on earth, at which stage in time is he God? At which stage in time is he man? And that's a very profound and complicated area. And people argue about it all the time. Now, to cut to the, the chase, we believe that Jesus Christ is always fully man and fully God. At the same time, as he walked the earth, surely he would constrain or restrict his divinity. If not, he don't have to eat, he don't have to drink, right? He, 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 don't have to, he cannot be killed. At which time would he constrain it? Now, that's a difficult thing to call. Certainly, this would be a time where his divinity was constrained. Because when he prayed to the Lord and said, if it is possible, remove this cup, which means that he doesn't know whether the cup will be removed or not, isn't it? If not, it's very funny to pray to God if you really know the outcome. So clearly at this stage in time, he has restrained his divinity and was like all of us. So one of the key lessons you must know is that when we look at the life, the love and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, you must not have the idea that, hey, you know, not fair, you know, the guy is God. So of course he can do this. Of course he can overcome temptation. Of course, he, he got some supernatural ability that I don't have. So don't blame me for messing up my life because all the things that is described in the Bible are not achievable. That's not true. The Bible says that Jesus is like us in every way, except what? Except he never sinned. So therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ absolutely is the perfect example for us because he's like us in every way, except he never sinned. And so when he called out to the Lord, and when he was facing the cross, in one of the Bible study group that I, I had before, someone asked a question, was he afraid? I said, what do you think? Another person said, cannot, how can he be afraid? Of course, he's very brave. Uh, he's, he's God, okay? My answer is that he was afraid. I once discussed this with senior pastor. Senior pastor said, How can you say that? Because he, he has such a revealed idea towards God, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. And traditionally, you, you don't want to think about Jesus being afraid because afraid sounds like a weakness, right? Can it be a sin kind of thing? But clearly that was the case because he was, as you read in Luke, sweating as if he's perspiring as if he sweats like, blood dropping on the floor and some Bible depiction painting actually paint blood dropping from him, you know. So that it comes from a deep sense of I don't know what you want to call it afraid or anxiety or whatever it is and so he called upon the Lord to do that. So we know that he had no special privileges. Then you say, what about the angel? Well, like him, all of us, I don't know whether you know this or not, God will send his angels to help you in a way that you don't know. And the Bible says that sometimes we take, we, we, we encounter angels that we do not know. And that's clearly stated in the word of God. The difference here between Christ and us, there is a difference, however, is that he was fully obedient to the will of God. So he asked that the cup be removed from him if it is possible because, my goodness, it's such a horrifying thing to be crucified. I, I still remember my Sunday school when I was young, one of the teachers described it in full detail and then she had picture and all that. It's so frightening. And, and she was describing how when you're hanging on a cross, you have your hands pierced and your feet pierced, your body weight will pull you down, right? So my goodness, the pain in your hand is going to be quite incredible. And then you, as you try to relieve that pain by moving forward, your feet are, are being nailed together. It's like, ooh, good gracious. And most people like spend three days hanging like that before they die, you know. And our Lord Jesus Christ died within a very short period of time. 
because prior to that, he was tortured to the night as well and being whipped. So one of the best depictions thus far is The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson. Uh, that one is, is as real as you can get, I think, where Jesus Christ is completely bloodied. His face is, in Chinese, it's like a bit like beat up until it's swelling everywhere. Now that's probably more like it. In traditional painting, the Jesus always bloody, but the face very pretty kind of thing because uh, painters don't quite dare to paint a horrifying looking Jesus. But if he was tortured the way the Bible described it to be, Mel Gibson's movie has a depiction that's more realistic. And that's how he died very, very fast. So that's the difference between Christ and us. But I want to extend the question a little bit further. Jesus Christ fulfilled the plan that God has for him. Does that also mean that there is a plan for us from God to fulfill? Because you, you look at the way Christ lived his life, every step along the way is in accordance to the plan of God. What about those of us, people like us? Is there a plan of God for us? Now, in the 1960s, the campus crusade for Christ, the founder, a guy called Bill Bright, wrote a little pamphlet that becomes very, very popular. It's called The Four Spiritual Laws. How many of you have heard of this before? Uh, four Spiritual Laws, and we have been trained by it even. So Bill Bright wrote The Four Spiritual Law as a tool to reach people for Jesus Christ. It's a very simplified way to tell people what the Christian faith is all about. And I was trained in this when the Billy Graham Crusade came to Singapore. They used this and we did mass training. And it's a very simple idea that you go and ask people this, four spiritual law. Have you heard of the four spiritual law? Then the guy will say, no, never. Okay, let me share this with you. Number one, God loves you. Have a wonderful plan for your life. And then number two, law number two, if man is sinful and separated from God, therefore he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Now, there are a lot of Bible verses that are so you, you are supposed to memorize it and show the people that. Uh, law number three, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him, you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. And number four, we must individually receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our life. Then we need to, uh, if you, do, you, do you know all this? If you know all this thing, you know you understand. Do you want to say the sinner's prayer with me? Then you say a sinner's prayer and then congratulations on your Christian. You know? So it is a way of evangelism too. I must say that till today, if I get only a very short period of time, like in a cap and all that kind of thing, I want to share the gospel. I spiritual law. I will, I will share based on that because it's a very nutshell way to quickly tell people what we are all about. However, today is no, no longer that popular. One of the, the things that wrong about this is it's very marketing oriented and also it's very human centered and not biblically sound as well especially for the reform people this particular phrase is problematic you meet someone in the street suddenly you say do you know that god has a wonderful plan for you in your life really is that really true there's a young man who used to worship with us who grew up listening to Dr. Tong and he say he's very reformed because he know a lot of reform stuff. And I, I can't remember what is it that I, I was sharing about this. He came after the worship service, he tell me, he said, Pastor, you should never tell people that God has loves you, first of all. He said, this is wrong. God don't love you. God hate you. I said, huh? <laughs> Where you get that from? He said, well, God hates sinners. So he told me that when he preached the gospel to his friend, he go and tell his friend first thing, God hate you. Because you are a sinner, you're going to burn in hell because of your sin. God cannot tolerate sin, blah, blah, blah. And, and he went to a long argument with me about this. He keep insisting that God hate us. And it's only because of Jesus Christ that God loves us. I, I don't want to go into fine detail with it, but you can see that there's some issue with this idea of talking to any stranger and say that God loves you and have a wonderful plan for you in your life. Because the question that we ask ourselves, is there a plan from God for us to fulfill. I think one thing it is quite clear is that God does not have a wonderful plan for every person on earth. In the sense of wonderful meaning that all oh, you have everything, you, you can gain everything and you are quite happy and everything is just hunky-dory, no problem at all. 
even for Christian, the plan may not be as wonderful as you think it is. So to then to tell someone that you have a wonderful plan is in a sense quite misleading because of the usual understanding of what wonderful means. Wonderful means wonderful. <laughs> you, 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 you are rich, you are happy, you get a lot of things in your life and everything will go smoothly. And clearly there are some people in, in the world that God would hate actually the evil people, you know, people who are just evil through and through and cause the death of millions of people and what have you, you know. Would you tell him that God really loves you? How does that work? Is it true? I, I, I would not really dare to go out there and declare that God loves every single person under the sun, especially in Reformed Evangelical understanding. However, it's very offensive. I just heard recently that some people who have been listening to my preaching on YouTube get very offended by me <laughs> because I, I say things like, you know, uh, God does not love everyone and God does not have the same plan for everyone. For the Reformed Evangelical understanding, however, it is very clear in the Bible that for the people of God, He does have a plan for their life. So therefore, to say to any Tom, Dick, and Harry, any stranger, that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for you in your life, I say there's some suspect. There's some, it's, it's suspect. I'm not certain that I can say that. However, I'm very clear that if you belong to God, the people of God, the Bible tells us He does have a plan for you in your life. In the sense that if you belong to Him, as the most loving Heavenly Father, all of Scripture tells us that He will guide you through your life and preserve you all the way to the end. So last week we spoke about this, right? How Peter is recovered to the end. And that must be the case for all of you as well. The perseverance of the saints. That God would not let you go if you really belong to Him. And so you say, then how do I know I belong to Him? Again, back to this same old question. The Bible is very clear. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and then what? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Apostle Paul says. And then a few verses later in verse 13, for everyone who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you are listening to this or if you are sitting down here, you are still wondering whether you are saved or not. You must place your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sin, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead on the third day, then you are a person belonging to God. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. Then you follow. I mean, you can be a lousy follower, and you fall down from time to time. But generally speaking, you follow because you confess that he is Lord. Lord means that he is the boss, okay? He is the master. So please don't go and spend your time trying to look for the lottery loophole here and there <laughs> and try to siam as much as you can and, and enjoy whatever earthly life you can and then try to find a small little possibility of squeezing through the door of heaven. Don't do that. Affirm that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and when you do that, yes, from time to time we fall, yes, we are terrible in some ways as I am. But know that the Bible really tells you that He is your Father. I mean, everything in the Bible, no, I must be very careful when I preach to you because I can go on for a long time <laughs> because everything is sort of in linked together. In the Lord's Prayer, you say, what's the first two words? Our Father, our Long Chong, okay, all of us. Father, like, He's not the, 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 the force or <laughs> the great someone somewhere who don't give a, a, a hood what happened to you in your life. He is your father. And like our loving father, he is he, he I use a wonderful plan. He has a wonderful plan for the people of God. But this is very difficult to understand. So some of the greatest minds in our world cannot understand this. Thomas Edison, greatest inventor ever. I have never seen the slightest scientific proof of the religious theories of heaven and health, of future life for individuals, or of a personal God. So I keep telling you that this idea that God is personal to us is very difficult to accept. That He will care for me. And so all the great minds cannot get this. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew certainly did not 
get this from his public statements that God would care for you. And yet that is the Bible's words for you. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you must know that God cares for you personal. And He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you to fulfill. So therefore, in fulfillment, God certainly has a plan for the Christian to fulfill. For the non-Christians, I don't know what kind of plan God has for him. And I, I want to encourage you to don't go and focus on all those things that you don't know, but focus on things you know. This plan is largely already seen in the Word, the Bible. So you say, what's that plan? Do I take this job? Do I take that job? Do I marry this girl? Do I marry that guy? The answer is the plan of God is already largely seen in His Word. And we are to follow that plan. I am of the opinion that when we follow the general teachings of the Bible, much of our life is settled. The problem is we don't want to. So people keep coming up to ask me, hey, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? I just read yesterday, thanks to all the women in my life watching Netflix, The Crown. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister, dead Prime Minister of the UK, after she retired, you know who she worked for? She worked for Philip Morris. You know what is Philip Morris? Tobacco Company. Ah, but I thought the Netflix says she Christian, ma, because the, the, the queen go and tell her that I didn't watch like I was listening when I was preparing this. <laughs> the queen said, our common Christian faith. So you tell me that a Christian work for Philip Morris, tobacco company, what do they do? They, they produce product that cause what? Lung cancer, 1,001 other diseases. Then you say, is this the will of God that I work for Philip Morris? Come on. How can that be? You tell me that God wants you to work for someone. Yeah, sure, give you high pay and everything. But they continue to kill tens and thousands of people every single day. You call that the will of God. Then you say, oh, I'm very confused to know what the will of God is. Hey, hello. The word of God is very clear in many aspects. However, the plan of God may not be an easy plan. It may be a lot harder than you think. And this is where the problem is. Because when we look at the will of God and the plan of God in our life, and we find it difficult, inconvenient, not to my liking. So therefore, I keep saying, hey, you know, I don't know, don't know the will of God. I, I, I find it very difficult. I find it, it doesn't make sense to me. So much so that some people have a different idea altogether. Now, a while ago, our brother Victor Wibawa mentioned this guy, Robert Kiyosaki, the author of the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He says, I don't think God cares if you are rich or poor. God loves you anyway. But if you want to be rich, then choose your church and preach it carefully. You see how man based this is? I don't care whether, I don't know whether God wants you to be rich or poor. La. But you want to be rich, uh, you better not go and listen to this young Teng Ming guy because he, he, he always took, never thought about all this getting rich. Better go and listen to all these other people, prosperity preacher. In Singapore, there's a few uh, mega churches. They tell you that God wants you to be rich. They tell you that God wants you to be healthy. They tell you that God wants you to have a smooth journey as a proof that you are his child. Long time ago, I saw a book, a very interesting cover. I never read the book, but I thought the title is very interesting. The title is, My Father Ain't a Used Car Salesman. <laughs> God, God, my father ain't a used car salesman. That means if I believe in God, my father not a used car salesman. He's not going to give me a broken down Volkswagen or whatever, <laughs> Nissan or whatever, Datsun. <laughs> no more Datsun, right? <laughs> my father not a used car salesman. He, uh, he's, he's the salesman who like those people downstairs. Uh, no, sorry, bad. Those people downstairs are pre-love cars, not, not good enough. Those people in the next building, those Maserati, la, Ferrari, la, all those names cannot pronounce that type. The more you cannot pronounce, the more expensive you get. Uh. My father is the one who owns this car. So Robert Siroki said, you want to be rich, go and look for those pastors, you know. And by the way, he's being charged for fraud and all that. So don't pay too much attention on him. <laughs> and that's what people want. They want this. Let me tell you that the correct understanding is this. The Christian author Max Lucado says, God never said the journey would be easy. Never. You look at the whole Bible. God never ever promised you that it's going to be an easy journey. But he did say that the arrival will be worthwhile. 
some variations say God never says it's easy, but God says it's good. I think that's a wonderful thing for us to remember. In Max Lucado's idea, what, what does arrival mean? Arrival means, as you have read in your second responsive reading, what will happen finally when we arrive? Revelation 20, then I saw thrones, as the Apostle John wrote the vision that he saw. Seated on them were those to whom the authority was given to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast and his image, those who never compromised, those who continue on the pathway of faith and had not retrieved, received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands. They came to life and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Blessed and holy are the ones who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Yes, the very next chapter, Revelation 21. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That is what arrival means. The Bible never promised that the journey is easy, but the Bible promises that it's worth it, that it is worth the while, it is good, it is something that we will look forward to ultimately, for this is the ultimate reality. So God certainly has a plan for the Christian to fulfill. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there is a plan for you all, every single one of you. You look into the mirror, you look at yourself. You are not an accident that happened. You are not someone who doesn't matter at all because God loves you so much that he called you out of the billions of people in the world to be his child you need to find out what that plan is. And it is largely already seen in the Bible. His word. The plan may not be easy, but it is good. And so the key difference is, will you be able to say, as our Lord Jesus Christ said, not my will, but yours be done. The more you are willing to say that, the more you will come into the great abundance that God has meant for every single one of us who belong to him. For we are his, and as you have read from Revelation, he is our God and he will be dwelling with us and forevermore. May our life begin to demonstrate this eternal truth, for the kingdom of God begins right here, right now with us. Eternity starts now. As we pray, as we struggle, as we attempt to fulfill the plan that God has for us in our life, may we always be able to say, not my will, O God, but yours alone. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the word that we have heard. And the difficulty of your word is not in the listening or the understanding, of course. The difficulty is always in the doing. And so we do pray that you help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. The Bible says that when we hear and not do, we deceive ourselves. We keep thinking that we are right, we are okay, we, we, our journey is fine. The reality is that we are missing out on so much of the blessing that you have installed for us when we decide to do things our own way. So teach us your way, O Lord, and may we be given the strength to follow your way so that when we shall see you face to face again, you will say that we have lived a good life, that we have been good and faithful, and we can come into your fellowship. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.